Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, once again, I'm Ashley Olson. I'm the executive director here at the National Willa Cather Center. And thank you again for joining us this evening. We are so pleased to be welcoming Dr. James English for tonight's invited lecture. Uh, before we do, I've been asked to remind you to please fill out your uh, session feedback forms, which are available in the Whova app if you've downloaded that on your phone. But we do also have paper forms available for those who prefer. So we do value your feedback and use that to help us plan future, future events, rather. So please go ahead and fill out those forms. We also have distributed question cards uh, for tonight's lecture. And after Dr. English concludes his prepared remarks, those will be collected by our staff. So if you'll just pass them to the center aisle or if you're seated at a table, a staff member will be around to collect those. I also want to offer sincere thanks to Humanities Nebraska for their support of tonight's program, which made the event freely accessible to all. Humanities Nebraska is a statewide nonprofit organization inspiring and enriching personal and public life by offering opportunities to thoughtfully engage with history and culture with additional funding from the Nebraska Cultural Endowment. So please, if you enjoy this type of program, please consider supporting Humanities Nebraska and the Willa Cather Foundation with a contribution. I also want to share that the National Willa Cather Center recognizes that forced servitude and unpaid labor gave rise to the society we know today. Willa Cather's own ancestors included both those who enslaved people and those who fought to free them. Cather, of course, struggled with her family's role in Virginia slaveholding culture during her lifetime, and of course, we continue to wrestle with the ramifications of that injustice today. Additionally, we acknowledge that we occupy the homelands of the Pari, the Washitagi, and the Osheti Sakowin peoples, territory that was also inhabited by the Oto Missouri, Osage, and other indigenous peoples following the arrival of American and European settlers. We are, as an organization, committed to honoring those people and recognizing their tribulations by providing a space for cultural exchange and for learning. And we uh, are convinced there will be a lot of that tonight. So uh, when planning for this year's conference, we knew, of course, that we had to mark the publication centenary of one of ours, uh, which is so often categorized, as mentioned earlier, as Willa Cather's war novel. And as Melissa alluded to in her opening remarks, we were also mindful that we did a thorough job of discussing the Great War's impact on Cather's life and war era writings, those of her literary contemporaries, as well as the legacy of the war on American culture as part of the 2016 Willa Cather Spring Conference. So in designing this year's conference experience, it seemed logical to draw attention to one of ours as Cather's Pulitzer Prize winning novel while examining the modern phenomenon of literary prizes more generally. Very early in our planning process, academic director Melissa Homestead made the recommendation to extend a speaking invitation to Dr. James English. And I can tell you after reading his book, I'm very grateful that she did. So at this time, I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Homestead to introduce our speaker. Hello, everybody. Uh, James English is John Welsh professor, a centennial professor of English, and the founder and faculty director of the Price Lab for Digital Humanities at the University of Pennsylvania, where he has taught since 1988. In our car drive on the way here, I picked him up at the airport. Uh, it was, we established that that means he arrived at the University of Pennsylvania just after I had dropped out of the English PhD program for the second time. Uh, obviously, I returned and finished, at which time he served as director of graduate studies at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, his book, The Economy of Prestige, Prizes and the Circulation of Cultural Value, was published in 2005, 
and was the reason for my suggestion for him as a keynote speaker for this conference. And Ashley told you that she's read it. She's not an English professor. And I think I can tell you, even as an English professor, it's a lively and accessible read, even as it's sophisticated. So take a look at it in uh, the bookstore downstairs. Uh, he is continuing his work in this vein uh, with a book in progress, Beauty by the Numbers, a study of uh, ranking systems, uh, ranking and rating systems for literature and art. So, uh, as, and he's going to talk tonight about uh, the award as a literary award as a judgment device. So, uh, we can welcome Dr. James English. Hi, everybody. Yeah, Melissa, Melissa was not my student uh, at Penn, so I can't take any credit, but I can join in our institutional pride that we feel about all her successes as a, as a scholar and educator. Um, yeah. Good, another hand, another hand for Melissa, well-deserved. Um, thanks, Melissa, and thanks to Tracy Tucker also for all of the um, work that she's done arranging everything. Uh, to get me out of here. Let me, um, first of all, make sure that I know how to get PowerPoint going. There we go. Okay. A lot of my work, um, at least for, geez, more than 20 years, has focused on questions about literary prestige, literary value, literary prestige. There's a special kind of economy, not a money economy, but more like uh, an economy of reputation, reputational economy. It's a system for circulating uh, literary status. And prizes are one of the most important instruments of this literary status economy. You could say that prizes are the, the hard currency um, of, uh, of the literary world. In, in the same sense that a, a college degree, a PhD, is the hard currency of, of the educational world. Um, you can be deeply learned, um, terribly intelligent. Um, and you're not gonna get credit for that in the wider world, but you get credit for a degree from Harvard, right? So um, in, in the same way, a literary award is cultural cash. It's widely accepted, widely fungible, even among people who don't know much of anything about literature. In fact, I'd say that uh, the literary awards are um, the most widely recognized form of literary capital. An author who wins the Nobel Prize for Literature or the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction uh, is recognized differently, evaluated differently nearly everywhere for the rest of her life. And Melissa talked earlier today about how, how the, the winning of a prize ramifies you know, throughout the author's um, lifetime and, and beyond uh, as well. This, um, there's been a kind of prizification uh, of how we think and write about literary merit over the last hundred odd years. Um, it seems to have started in France in the very early part of the 20th century and emerged in the US soon after. And Willa Cather was in fact, um, uh, along, along with uh, Edith Wharton, was very important in the, uh, in the emergence of this, uh, of this, this phenomenon. Within, I'll do some slides now. Within a few months of winning the Pulitzer, Cather's young publisher, uh, Alfred A. Knopf, began leveraging the prize as a marketing device. Um, this is the summer of, um, 20, of uh, uh, 1923, so just a few months after she won the prize. And here's the Pulitzer Prize um, being used as advertisement, not only for one of ours, the winning book, but if you look down below, a Lost Lady, the novel that she had um, ready to publish in the fall. So here Knopf is using the prize as sort of like a, a guarantee of quality for future work. Um, I think the first time that that happened in, in America. Also in 2023, uh, sorry, 1923, uh, what's 100 years more or less? Uh, uh, um, also in the same year, um, a little later in the, in the summer, um, Knopf had this awarded the Pulitzer Prize for 1922 printed um, across, you know, right, right in the middle of the dust jacket 
for, I think this is the seventh printing of the trade edition of, of one of ours. Now he was following here the rival publishers, uh, Appleton, who had put on the spine of a third edition of um, Horton's Age of Innocence, which had won the prize what, three years prior, uh, had put uh, a Columbia Prize winner. At that time, people, the Pulitzer was still very new. People talked about it as the University Prize or the Columbia University Prize, stuff like that sometimes. But, so that appeared on the spine of this, of this Wharton um, uh, novel. But um, Knopf clearly giving it a lot more real estate. On the, on the dust jacket. And this innovation led to what we see here on the, um, uh, the, the, the vintage classic edition um, across the top, this printing of, um, of the, the winning of a prize on subsequent novels or on the novel that won. And you see this as a badge or uh, a sticker or a strap of various, uh, various forms of, of publicity. So this is attaching the prize to the books like a kind of secondary brand name um, by, the, by the late 20s, already in 1929, uh, Cather is being referred to as a Pulitzer Prize authoress. This is on um, a story to, you know, to kind of draw in people who might otherwise not know who she is or be, or be interested to read the story. Um, Pulitzer Prize authoress. So here is the name of the newspaper mogul, right, being like attached to Cather's name as a kind of guarantee of uh, quality. Um, and by the time she died in 1947, you're starting to see then prizes in the obituaries of, um, of, of literary people, novelists, right up at the top, usually the first, sometimes the second sentence says here, um, one of ours won the Pulitzer Prize. So this is 1947, and this process is just beginning to really um, blossom out in the obituaries. Today, we see things like this, you know, in the New York Times when Toni Morrison died in 2019, um, this enormous career. Um, of course, the Times now, the online edition, they have video clips um, in the featured obits. And, um, and of course, the clip here is her um, oh, being awarded the Nobel Prize. So um, it's, the, it's the main fact about Toni Morrison in this obituary, even for someone like Doris Lessing, um, when she died in, what was it, 2013, um, they, they have this clip of her um, being notified that she won the Nobel Prize. Never mind that what she said was, I couldn't care less. <laughs> she, she didn't, Doris Leslie didn't care about the Nobel Prize, but the New York Times, the obit writers, you know, they really do, they really do care. Um, and even, so even when Philip Roth died, um, you can see, I don't know if you see everything on, I'm not seeing the whole thing on my screen here, but um, you know, he didn't win the Nobel Prize, but they still have to say, uh, the Nobel Prize eluded Mr. Roth, but he won, and then you get the list of all the prizes that he, that he did win. So you know, we're completely accustomed to this um, uh, today, and I'm kind of belaboring the, the point, just because this is what got me first interested in prizes um, way back when, um, my wife is a big obituary reader. I'm not, but the papers in our house were open to obituaries. And I got interested in, in, in writing a, an article, a history of literary obituaries in America. And I started working on this, and I, I worked on it for like 10 minutes, and I realized that at some point in the mid to late 20th century, I'm just reading these lists of prizes all the time. And I thought, that's, that's curious. There's been this shift in the way value is measured and distributed and talked about that's reflected in these obituaries and it's really about prizes. So I started digging into, into prizes and I ended up um, writing this, uh, this book. And I've worked on prizes in various ways uh, since then uh, from time to time. In the process, I have talked to a lot of people about prizes, people in the industry and, and, and just you know other people, friends and stuff. And I don't think, in fact, I'm sure, no one has ever said to me, um, I just love prizes. I think they're so wonderful, I wish there were lots more of them. It's like nobody ever expresses that opinion. Uh, sorry if, if that is your opinion, anyone, but uh, I've, I've, never, I've never heard it. Um, what I hear again and again you know, is this standard thing to say about prizes, which is to complain about them, about how wrongheaded they are, um, how kind of embarrassing 
they are, and, and above all, how there's just too damn many of them. Um, and we could see here in just some, um, some quotes that I, that I plucked out, you know, going back to the middle of the 19th century, you've already got Lewis Carroll riffing on this too many prizes theme, this democratization of prizes. Everybody has won and all must have prizes. The, the basic idea is that there's too many prizes for the, um, the, the quantity of accomplishment or achievement um, that prizes are meant to, uh, to measure. I did a couple of graphs. Um, I'll just uh, point to these. This is the number of literary awards per 1,000 new book titles published. You have to compare prizes to something. I mean, sure, there's a lot more prizes now than 100 years ago, but there's a lot more books, there's a lot more authors, more everything. But even compared to the, the rise in the, uh, the publishing industry, you could see how prizes have risen much faster in the US and in the UK. And this is true of other arts and, and fields of entertainment as well. Here's movies. By the, by the, the first decade of, of this century, you've got 2,000, nearly 2,000 prizes, film prizes being awarded. And there's only 1,000 feature films being made uh, each year. So, all right, so this is the, um, this is the great complaint, you know, that there's, that there's too many. Why is this happening? Um, why so many prizes? And especially when so many people involved in prizes seem to agree that prizes are, are basically obnoxious and that there's already too many of them. Um, a new prize is founded uh, in some field of literature or the arts, somewhere in the world, about every hour or two. You know, and that process can, continues. So why, my, my quick answer to that, and this is gonna be rather schematic, so bear with me, I'm gonna to try to keep talking about prizes as an economic instrument. Um, but my quick answer is that a prize is a, the multi-tool of culture. It's like the leather man of letters if we're talking book, book prizes. Um, and, and the reason I, I want to stress that is because all this founding of prizes is not being driven by just one kind of individual or group or institution while like others are righteously struggling to prevent you know, the, 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 the increase of prizes or keep them out of their, out of their worlds. Um, there's a narrative about prizes, uh, for example, that runs like this. Um, the forces of commerce are trying to overtake the forces or infiltrate um, or in some way undermine um, the worlds of art by imposing prizes on them. So this would be like Alfred A. Knopf is pushing the Pulitzer Prize, he's big, using it to leverage, to make profits in his publishing business, and Sinclair Lewis refusing the prize in 1926 is, um, is guarding art against the evil of prizes like that, but it's just not true. I mean, Lewis was also promoting the Pulitzer, as we heard earlier today. Lewis accepted his Nobel Prize. Lewis was a prize guy, and, um, and basically everyone is in some way or not, uh, uh, some way or other. But, but different individuals and institutions have different aims. They have different uh, tasks that they're trying to accomplish, and they, they all find, even if their tasks or aims are, are, are opposed, they find that the prize is a ready-to-hand tool that they can use to advance their aims, or at least that they, that they think they can. Um, so hence the multi-tool. Um, it does all these different things for different, for different people. So I'm gonna go through some of these, some of the um, people and institutions that are founding prizes. One classic kind a prize founder, relevant in Cather's case, would be um, someone who's not especially literary, not a big reader of poems or novels probably, but has a lot of money, right? Happens to be enormously wealthy, a mogul uh, of some kind. Most moguls, um, and again, apologies if any of you are moguls, but um, <laughs> most moguls are somewhat brutish and disreputable. Um, they're, uh, they're, they, they may be looking for a way to, to cleanse and polish their image for posterity. This is something that prizes can do. They're a burnishing tool, uh, right? Um, Alfred Nobel, still alive and well in the, uh, in the 1890s and living in, uh, in Paris. He opens the paper uh, one, one morning and he sees an obituary 
for himself. Uh, surprised to read that he's dead. Um, and, uh, and the phrasing was um, uh, to the effect that Alfred Nobel, the merchant of death, is himself dead. Merchant of death because as the inventor of modern high explosives and as an arms merchant, um, he, uh, his inventions had caused uh, a great deal of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of death. Um, so this was a wake-up call for him. I don't know, you know, I've never actually seen this newspaper, um, so, but this is the lore, uh, at least, and certainly he knew that he was referred to in these kinds of terms. Um, and so he, um, he contrived the, the Nobel Prizes to kind of cleanse his fortune and try to disassociate himself from death and associate himself with, um, with higher and more beautiful things. And, and, and it worked, right? I mean, when we hear the name Nobel today, the first thing we think of is the prizes and maybe first of all, the Peace Prize. Um, but, uh, uh, but, but he's, he's more remembered, I think, as a patron of peace than as a, um, a merchant of, of death. Here in the US, um, our, our, our own premier literary awards, the Pulitzers, were established partly in imitation of the Nobels. Joseph Pulitzer, um, he was not a merchant of death, but maybe a merchant of muck, you know? I mean, he was one of the real uh, inventors of the yellow journalism um, in, uh, in the later 19th century. Um, scandal sheets, you know, the fore forerunners of kind of today's tabloid news and shout fest cable uh, uh, news. So, um, and I think it's probably the case that journalism was held in, in even lower regard than, than, it is, uh, than, it, than it is now. So, um, so Pulitzer saw what Nobel had done and sometime around 1905 or six, he got his lawyers in and he said, I'm gonna to wanna to do something like this. I wanna found a, uh, you know, an institution to give out prizes. I want um, the prizes to be uh, in, uh, uh, in journalism, but as a way of making journalism more reputable, we're going to have prizes also for the high arts of writing, for the novel, poetry, drama, music, right? And this way the dirty art is elevated and Pulitzer associated with the dirty art. Though, to be fair, by that time, he was really turning away from all the sensational sort of um, scandal journalism that, that he had pioneered and was, was trying to make his paper, the world, into something uh, more, more respectable. But so this, this, this um, elevation, this is um, repeated again and again. A lot of the literary awards in uh, this country were founded by personal fortunes, rich people, and they, and, and they bear the, the wealthy patron's name, Ruth Lilly, Dorothea Tanning, um, John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur, um, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Wyndham, uh, Wyndham Campbell. I can't remember. Sandy, Sandy Campbell and Wyndham. Anyway, two guys. Wyndham Campbell Literature uh, Prizes, uh, which are which are worth 165,000 each. Nine nine awards uh, a year. A lot of people haven't heard of them, but that's because there's so many prizes um, they get lost in the in the wilderness. Um, but that prize, the um, the Wyndham Campbell Awards is administered out of the Beinecke Library at Yale University, the Rare Books Library, Yale. And that gets us to another, uh, another kind of uh, agent of prize founding, which is private foundations or universities or libraries. Nobel, he founds a new foundation, the Nobel Foundation, but the Nobel Foundation then farms out the actual work of judging and awarding the individual prizes to established, uh, well-respected institutions, the Swedish Academy in the case of the, of the Literature Award. Um, Pulitzer goes to Columbia University and puts his um, institution, the Pulitzer Foundation, under the auspices of Columbia. So um, in, in this way too, there's a kind of borrowing 
of prestige by the founder, um, borrowing the prestige of an, an old or ancient and, and, and established institution. What's in it for them? Well, different things. I mean, the Swedish Academy really didn't want to be judging this World Literature Prize. They didn't, they weren't equipped to do it. They weren't qualified to do it, and they knew that. And it all seemed like a sort of crazy extension of their, uh, of their business. Um, but it did give them, it would, it would give them, if they did it, you know, a lot of clout across Europe, um, which Swedish Academy didn't have. Um, because it was a lot of money, and there was also a lot of walking around money for the, for, for the Swedish Academy itself. Built a new building, salaries about equivalent to like a professor's salary every year for the rest of their life, you know. So um, Nobel's will was very generous in that way. All right, so these kinds of institutions get drawn in as well and are willing uh, um, participants, enthusiastic participants. Now, in most countries, uh, outside of the US, there aren't tax breaks like we have for private philanthropy. The arts aren't funded indirectly through tax breaks, but directly by the government. So a lot of prizes around the world are, are founded um, by governments, national governments or local governments. Um, and their motivations are pretty straightforward to celebrate national identity and national literature or regional <laughs> identity. Um, Sometimes language also, linguistic nationalism, um, to celebrate work in a particular, a particular language. Um, also in these countries where you don't have philanthropic sponsorship of prizes, you see a lot of companies, corporations, that are sponsoring uh, prizes. It's very common in the, in the UK and Italy and other, other places. And their motives, their goals, are straightforward too. It's really just advertising, you know, brand recognition. And um, it's not fundamentally different for a corporation than sponsoring like um, a sporting event or a sports team or something like that. In fact, if you look at the, uh, at the ledgers of um, expenses of corporations, they'll often have you know, under their like marketing and advertising budget, they'll have one line for arts and sports. So it's all the same. Um, and prizes are not that expensive. They're not that expensive. But a disadvantage um, of this, sorry, I'm facing a blank page here, so this, this could be good. Um, <laughs> uh, but a disadvantage of this is that as sponsorships change, you know, an advertising strategy shift or there's a takeover or change of name of the company or whatever, these prizes, they, they lose their name and they have, to be, um, re, they have to be renamed. So like the Orange Prize, which is a prize for women novelists in Britain, it was the Orange Prize, then it was the Orange Broad, Broadband Prize, then it was the Bailey's Prize for 10 or 15 years or more. Now it's the Women's Prize for Fiction. You don't have a corporate sponsor. It's very difficult to, um, the Whitbread Book of the Year, it's now the Costa Award. Some people still refer to them by their old names and it's just, it's hard to keep people invested in a prize when they're not even really sure what it's called, you know? So, um, so there, there are problems with this, but it's a very common model to have corporate corporations. Also, industry groups, industry professionals. Um, you know, I think like the model for this is probably the Oscars, which is the, the movie industry, the big studio saying um, people think that our um, that 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 what we do is really just junk entertainment. But cinema is a high art. We should have prizes. Let's do prizes. Um, so they uh, they they got out there and, um, and, and did it to the, uh, for the Oscars. But you see this with literary publishers uh, as well, sponsoring prizes. The National Book Awards is supported by the American publishing industry to show the quality um, publishing the American book industry does. It's probably the second most important prize, you know, after the Pulitzer. Um, they would say at the National Book Foundation, the most important prize, more legitimate than the Pulitzer, of course, that was their founding uh, goal. Um, what else? Readers groups, you know, uh, well, oh, sorry, writers associations. Yeah, you know, writers associations. So um, writers could 
can, can see the prize as um, a way to structure their association with one another. You know, it's a way, it's a sort of a rallying point for an annual meeting, can provide a, a, big, a big occasion to pull people together, draw in membership dues, promote solidarity of writers of a certain stripe. Um, and especially writers for whom there is no prize, who are regarded as ineligible, you know, for, um, for, for a Pulitzer or a National Book Award because of the nature of the writing that they do or um, who they are. Um, they're not gonna win those awards. So they say, let's have an award for us. Um, the Lambda Literary Awards for gay and lesbian literature would be uh, an, an example, or the Edgars for mystery writing, you know, or the, the Hugos and Nebulas for science fiction writing. We could name a hundred uh, of these. This is, um, this is a very important part of prize founding. It's like, hey, where's the prize for us, right? And as many prizes as there are, there's a lot, but there's still plenty of people out there who aren't winning a lot of prizes. I'm not winning a lot of prizes. So they could say, let's, you know, let's found a prize for, for our group. And readers groups do the same thing. We see a lot of this proliferating online these days with readers, fans of certain, uh, certain kinds of, of fiction. Um, you know, it's like, uh, romance fiction, erotic romance fiction, paranormal romance fiction. It's like, let's have a prize for the best paranormal romance. And this can be, again, you know, it's a, it's a way to attract attention to the genre. Um, but also it's a way to kind of have fun, maybe meet celebrities, maybe like have some kind of online contact with a, a writer that you really like, that kind of thing. So it's fan driven. And even people who disdain prizes, who say they hate prizes, um, and who hate the whole awards industry and say it's shambolic and it's an imposition on art and, 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 and it, it brings the wrong values to bear these haters, and there's many, many of them, um, they often find that the best tool for them to express this uh, hatred for prizes is another prize, right? <laughs> Found the anti-prize, the mock prize, um, the, uh, uh, the golden raspberries, the ignobles. You know, back in the 1920s, there was a literary prize in London, a satiric prize called the Dead Fish, which was awarded to you know, a bad, a bad writer. We have the Bad Sex Award, you know, now it's another literary, literary prize. But these prizes, these mock prizes, they can become a pretty big deal, like kind of hard to distinguish from real prizes. This is a still from, from this year's uh, Golden Raspberry Awards, the Razzies. Um, I think they're giving out the worst director prize here. He was not there to receive it. Sometimes they show up to receive these prizes. Um, but John Wilson, the guy who, who, who does these prizes, who invented them, um, and I mean, he's basically committed his life to promoting and managing these prizes. It's not really a joke anymore, you know, to John, to John Wilson. It's a pretty big deal. So, so these prizes, um, all of these different kinds of agents um, are all not only participating in prizes, but founding them. And if we consider other kinds of participants uh, beyond the founders, think about journalists and broadcasters. From the, from the start, even before the Nobel Prizes were founded, journalists and broadcasters loved prizes and awards because they, they can, they can make a really unglamorous activity, like writing a novel, you know, um, seem newsworthy, potentially exciting to readers. Um, they are, they're competitions, almost like a sporting event. They're repeated every year. You can root for a player, you know, in a prize competition. You can root for the underdog, or you can root for an American, or you can root for, um, a newcomer or something like that. Um, so journalists are drawn to prizes. The Booker Prize is televised. This is pre-pandemic, a couple years before the pandemic, but that's a still from the BBC's televising of the Booker Prize. The National Book Awards were televised before the pandemic. They've been streamed during the 
pandemic live streamed in sort of split screens and stuff, not very satisfactory. But they'll probably get back to, um, you know, to some kind of televisual presentation. And you can even bet on these prizes, just like you can on a tennis match. You know, here's the odds from the Booker Prize uh, last year. They, they, in fact, the favorite one. Uh, not always the case. It's hard to predict. Um, one of the recent scandals at the Swedish Academy, they've had a few, um, involved a guy named Jean-Claude Arnaud, who uh, it turned out he's the husband of a Swedish Academy member, a member of the Nobel Prize Committee. She was telling him the winner, they choose the winner a couple days before the announcement. He was leaking that information to his gambling buddies in Paris. Uh, so um, that explains the sudden like, shift of the odds the day before uh, the Nobel in a couple of, of recent years. Um, finally, the literary award is useful to ordinary readers, the consumers of literature who are faced with a daunting flood of new books every year and need some kind of tool, uh, some kind of device to help them choose from all these books. Um, this is a shot of the floor of my office when I was judging the National Book Award in 2016. This is just some of the novels that arrived in the mail in my office for me to read to judge for, the, uh, for that prize. There were, there were more than that. There were 400 um, of them. Um, and even that, even if we had the whole 400, of course, that's just the thinnest layer of highest quality you know, literary fiction. These are the novels nominated by publishers for consideration for the National uh, Book Award. Um, a new novel these days is published. We can't include the electronic novels, the e-books. A new novel is published about every five minutes, right? So how do you how do you select? Faced with this difficulty, um, we rely on what an economic sociologist named Lucian Karpik calls judgment devices. And here, at last, I'll get to my title and tell you a little about judgment devices and why he thinks that um, uh, they're they're so important. And I and, and I agree. Karpik draws a distinction between ordinary commodity goods, or what the, uh, the sociologist economists call uh, search goods. Just a distinction between search goods. Search good would be like gas for your car. You know, you, you say, where can I get gas? And then you go and get it. You just search for it, and you get it. And price is really the only thing that, uh, that, that figures in a search good. Whereas an experience good, an experience good is something that you can't um, you can't know uh, the quality of it until you experience it, right? It's like you can't just search and grab. It's something that it has differential quality, and the quality is only apparent in consumption. So the classic example in the literature is fine wine. Fine wine. It's like, I need more information about what's in this bottle. Um, I need to taste it. Or, or I need to rely on some judgment devices. Um, of course, the distinction is a little, you know, sometimes the search good. Your gas might cause pinging in your car. You experience bad problems with that gas. Still, this is a schematic um, set of distinctions that the, uh, that the ec economists use. And when they get to novels and poems, they move beyond experience goods, though, sure, um, you know, you read a novel, you don't know whether it's going to be good or bad until you've read it. Um, the novel can surprise you or disappoint you, often does, um, hence experience good. Um, but we can go one step beyond that and talk about a novel as a credence good. A credence good is something that even if you experience it, you still um, can't be sure. Right, you still can't be sure. So an example would be a novel like, let's say, James Joyce's Ulysses. So a guy reads James Joyce's Ulysses, gets about halfway and goes, this is so boring, this is terrible, give me Game of Thrones any day. Um, but that same guy may also say, I mean, okay, I know Ulysses is great, but I just don't want to read it right now, okay? So that's credence. That's that's putting some credit in the judgments that have been made by 
what Carpet calls um, you know, an expertise regime. Expertise regime. I get this from my students all the time you know, about books. They'll say, I know it's great, but not for me. Um, so um, Carpet pushes it one step further, and this is sort of his innovation in, in all this. He says, um, it's not even, a, a novel is not even really a, a credence good. It goes beyond credence good because like a classic credence good in the literature is healthcare services. It's like a, um, uh, an operation, I don't know, a knee operation or something like that. So you say, all right, well, I experienced more pain in the recovery from my knee operation than I was expecting to, but I know that, I know that my surgeon is great because experts say he's great because he rated top and you know it's a great facility and everything i'm not saying anything against it but i did experience more so that's like you know a credence good a credence good is still as in the case of knee surgery it's still comparing apples to apples one knee surgery to another but with novels at least serious novels we're not comparing apples to apples they're fundamentally different they're singular you know a good novel um, is, is unique, it's unique. So this is why Karpik says we need to think about the economics of singularities. Um, uh, and it's when you get into the, the economics of singularities that judgment devices really come into their, into their own. This is where you need lots of judgment devices and you find lots of judgment devices crowd around. So for literature, this would be prizes and awards, notably, but also um, book reviews, online consumer reviews, blurbs and testimonials, uh, statements by celebrities, about, I love this, I love this book, all these kinds of things. Um, all these judgment devices um, says Karpik, they are, um, they are so numerous and so difficult to kind of put together that we require what he calls a coordination regime, a coordination regime, a way of sort of sorting and sifting through all of these evaluative judgments that are being made. I think prizes in this scheme, they are part of the coordination regime for literature, but they're maybe the most important part of the coordination regime um, because, because they draw in so many different kinds of, of players, both literary and non-literary, amateurs and professionals, institutional and individual, because so many different kinds of people come in, they serve as a kind of clearinghouse or bourse of literary value coordinating a complex set of valuations regarding authorial reputation, social connections, publisher status, artistic quality, of course, but also like political valence, um, journalistic interest, even money itself is part of this. And all of these kinds of value are brought into play in the, uh, in, in the prize scene. Um, so they become an indispensable part of the regime that renders singular works comparable, enabling us to appraise and select. Um, without them, you know, we would be, we'd, really be, we'd really be at a loss. So, so this, is a, this is my sort of rough and schematic way of explaining why prizes are so ubiquitous, um, why they serve so well as the money of culture. Whether we are a dying billionaire right, um, uh, or a literary journalist, or you and me just browsing books in the bookstore, the prize turns out to be the most exceptionally handy of devices. Uh, whether we, whatever we might think of prizes, or whatever we might think we think of prizes, we reach for them um, for these reasons. Um, but I want to conclude here with, with one, one final point which is that uh, just because uh, book prizes are so useful to so many bookish uh, and unbookish people does not mean that they're good for literature. Uh, within the coordination regime, prizes appear um, for the most part to reinforce existing scales of value, 
rather than to advance new ones. They're often quite explicitly founded to celebrate lifetime achievement that stretches back a couple of generations. The early Nobel Prizes went to relatively conservative and old-fashioned authors, the innovative figures of the day, Tolstoy, Hardy, Conrad, James, Zola, and the entire naturalist movement. They were all passed over uh, famously, notoriously, as were Joyce, Wolf, Wyndham Lewis, and the modernists um, in the 20s and 30s. The Pulitzer board likewise eschewed modernism for the most part, especially in the poetry prizes, but the novels as well. They favored work that, as we heard earlier today, you know, matched up to this official and kind of tweaked language, best presents the wholesome atmosphere of American manners and manhood. Um, the biggest prizes, the most visible ones, tend to be trailing rather than leading indicators. They celebrate the already celebrated. And this, of course, has social implications, since to be celebrated by major institutions and recognitions is to gain a kind of real power. Prizes tend, on the whole, to further empower the already empowered neighborhoods of any given cultural space. The Oscar So White backlash brought home the fact that the Academy Awards are even more tilted away from people of color than is the movie industry workforce itself. They have not been an instrument of revaluation, but a device for doubling down on a very unrepresentative status quo. A particularly stubborn feature of this conservatism is the slow and as yet incomplete crawl of the major literary awards toward recognition of women authors. The Nobel Prize is the most prominent example. There have been 119 Nobel laureates in literature, just 17 of them women. There has been some increase over time, but still, since Toni Morrison won the prize in 1993, there have been only seven more women winners to 21 men. Things have changed more significantly at the major national literary awards, uh, especially in the English-speaking world, which is um, less uh, extreme in this way than, um, than, than others. But still, if you look, this is the decade, 60s, 70s, up to the 2000s, and this is all short list for major novel of the year awards in, all, in the English speaking countries. It's never gotten um, beyond about 60, uh, 60, 40. So this under recognition of women endures. Um, as we celebrate Willa Cather's Pulitzer this week, we should not forget that she was one of only 15 women to receive the prize in its first 50 years. Um, and not only that, but if we go back from now, 50 years, and look at the most recent 50 years, it's exactly the same ratio. Again, 15 women since 1972. And only two in the most recent decade since 2012. Um, and women through this period um, are writing roughly 50% of the published works of literary fiction. Um, even more striking is that when women authors do win major awards like the Pulitzer, their winning novels nearly always center on the story of a male protagonist. Right? We could call it the Claude Wheeler effect. Right? <laughs> um, when I judged the National Book Award in 2016, our jury was very conscious uh, of this tendency to favor male authors, male stories, male milieu when selecting winners. Um, it's not a secret. And uh, we talked about it explicitly. Three of the five of us on the jury were women. More than half of the 400 nominated novels were by women, significantly more than half. And yet, our long list, our short list, here's our, uh, the four women authors on our long list. Our long list, our short list, and our winner all followed the historical pattern. The finalists were 60% male. The winner was Colson Whitehead. At the awards banquet in New York, Lisa Lucas, then director of the National Book Foundation, watched as one by one, the women majority juries she had overseen presented the four National Book Awards to men. She, uh, she tweeted, all dudes. <laughs> that, was a, that was her tweet when the ceremony was over. All dudes. Um, even if, as in this case, the 2016 National Book Awards, there's a real commitment among the individuals involved to resist the male tilt of the literary value system. 
And even if the judges are left entirely to their own devices to choose their, their, their long list, short list, and winner as they will, in the National Book Award, really, there's a firewall. They don't interfere at all, unlike the board at the Pulitzers. Um, but even so, the judges are not exactly autonomous agents. The award possesses a powerful agency of its own. It brings to the decision-making certain logics or laws or rules of practice. The, the rule of cultural inertia, for example, that says a group of judges lodged within a large and powerful field of symbolic exchange will tend to judge as other groups of judges have done before them. The prize, in short, is not just a usefully manipulable tool for those who sponsor, administer, promote, judge, receive, or consult it. It manipulates us as well. Just as we say the financial markets have a mind of their own, so does the market for singularities. Through a host of economic instruments, but especially through its most ingenious gadget, the prize, the economy of literary prestige imposes itself on its human inventors. Thanks. Uh, I know I'm going to read the questions, but I'm not sure where I'm supposed to be. Where am, am I just, anybody? Okay. okay. Uh, so we have some audience questions. Uh, well, one thing I did actually want to say is that of those 15 of 50 in the first years of Pulitzer, most of them were in the first 15 years. Were right, yeah, right away. Yeah. yeah. No, that's right. There's this like, it, the curve is like that. And especially the immediate post-war years, it's just like a desert for women. women. That's true yeah. of many things. Of many in, things, yeah. Yes, women yes. were physicians before World War II and yeah. then they and then went they further over. Yeah, yeah, okay. good. that's a good point. Yep. Yeah, yeah. But um, the first question actually sort of begins from a different place than you were just ending, because I think someone wrote the question early on, but it'll be interesting uh -huh. to hear. So aren't book awards purely personal to the committees choosing them and not always a perfect testimonial to how good a book really is? Well, for sure, judges, I mean, I think that judges of prizes in general take their work seriously. That's my impression. Um, and they take it personally. They're invested in the process. So that like that, that posture of kind of disdain and condescension toward prizes that I talked about that's kind of obligatory. If you talk to a judge about the prize that they judged, they'll say, well, it was different for you know, my committee. Like we were serious. Like, you know, we weren't that way. It's like it's other prizes. So, so there is this personal investment, but... Um, but it's not a personal investment in just my taste, but trying to... It's, it, it, there is the weight of the, the role of prize judge that um, it, it, I think judges can feel that they are serving a function. They're serving a social function, and that, is, that the, the selection of a winner is different from the selection of a favorite, right? It's not my favorite. It's the one that I think is most deserving in some, some other way. And it might also be you know, my favorite, but it might not be. I would say, for example, Colson Whitehead, the Underground Railroad, I think is a very worthy winner, and I was very happy to support it um, when, uh, when it won the National Book Award. But if you ask me what's my favorite novel of these novels, the one that I would like read again tomorrow, it would be News of the World by Paulette Giles, that like perfect little Western, you know? It's an amazing book. Not as good a movie. Uh, but so if you saw Tom Hanks' movie version and you thought that's okay, read the novel, I recommend it. So there is a, there is a gap there, yeah. Okay, so this one's pretty specific. Uh, please explain your statement in the economy of prestige that John Leonard praised beloved in the most lavish imaginable terms, being a devout admirer and personal friend of Toni Morrison. Uh, I'm not sure what to explain. I mean, he he did that. He was a um, a good friend of Toni Morrison's, a huge admirer. He saw her as the greatest novelist 
um, living in America. He thought that she was not getting the kind of critical attention that she deserved, that she got lots of positive critical attention, but he was out there saying she deserves a Nobel Prize, you know? And he was, he was there at the table um, when, um, when she took her entourage to, um, to Stockholm to collect the, uh, the prize. I mean, he was, a, he was an early, strong, um, and enduring advocate of Toni Morrison's work. So critics can do that sometimes for an author. Okay. Uh, could you comment on the toxic relationship between authors and their Goodread reviewers? Oh, this is, goes to ranking because uh, there's been a recent suggestion by author Twitter that only five-star reviews should be allowed. That only five-star <laughs> reviews should be allowed. Wow, that really is like the dodo, isn't it? Everyone shall have prizes. Only the highest, only A's um, for my students from now on. Um, so what's the question? So, so the, the question, though, more <laughs> is, I don't know. I, I don't know if you don't, follow Goodreads, but I there's do, kind of a toxic, closely. right, a, something about the toxic relationship between authors and the Goodread reviewers. I see, yeah. I mean, I don't know much about that. I, from, what I've, uh, from what I've seen, um, with recent like interviews with authors, and I, I'm working with a group of, of students and um, and, a, and a, a data specialist right now on Goodreads. We're mining data off of Goodreads and studying it. Um, and these the two of these students are doing interviews with Goodreads authors, and um, and what they're saying is, I don't read the reviews. I don't, you know, I don't look at it because, yeah, it's toxic, it's, it's offensive, it's unpleasant. It's not something that I do. I develop better relationships with my readers on my personal website or in other places where they don't find Goodreads conducive to, like, good relationships with, with readers. So, yeah, I think that's spot on. Okay. Um, how would you dismantle the system of prizes and culture to make room for new systems of value? Imagine a new world, Jim. You know, I, it's so sad, but I can't. I can't, imagine, I can't imagine a world without prizes. You know, as soon as I start thinking about that, I think, well, we should found a new prize that's different from all those other prizes. But that's exactly what everybody has been doing all along. Every prize is differentiating itself, you know, from the, uh, from, from the previous prizes. It's the anti-Nobel or the, I mean, the National Book Award was the anti-Pulitzer expressly. And when the National Book Critics Circle Award came along, it was the Anti-National Book Award, as well as the Anti-Pulitzer. So everybody's trying to be more mm, closer to authentic, artistic values, purer, better somehow, more representative. Um, that's what's been going on. I don't think But I mean, there, could there be something there, to recognize? Well, I mean, there are just so many prizes, but is there really one book that is purely good for everyone. I mean, I would think of Barbara Herrnstein Smith's contingencies of value argument. Yeah. We just went English professor, sorry. Um, but, you know, when you say good, it's good for what, right? And there are good things for different readers for good, you know, different reasons. Yeah. Well, nobody believes that the, the novel that wins the Pulitzer or the author that wins the Nobel Prize is therefore the greatest of all, right? It stands out. Like, that's not really the relationship we have to prizes. But um, our way of complaining about prizes and of kind of enjoying, uh, you know, love-hating prizes and the judgments that are made by prize juries um, invokes for us the idea of a kind of absolute greatness, purity, because the problem with the prize is not getting it right. It's getting it wrong. So that suggests that there is some sort of right scale of value. There's a better scale of value, a higher scale of value. We can't articulate it. We, we, can't, we, we can't simply produce it. Um, and that's sort of the point. So if you try to produce it socially through mechanisms like prizes, you're always going to fail. But because you're failing, we can believe that there is this other sort of higher, purer thing. I would say that there, that there isn't. Right, that that's a kind of collective make-believe. Um, and prizes are very useful because they help us to keep that collective make-believe aloft. Um, they stage the imperfection of our kind of social judgments. But what we really have, finally, are just mechanisms that are just as messy and bad as prizes, 
I mean, you can point to other kinds of judgment device, um, like Goodreads reviews. I don't think they're better than, than prizes necessarily, right? They're, me they're just as messy. Or the kinds of decisions that Melissa and I make as professors when we choose which books to teach and which ones not to, right? So the universities have a lot to say about the construction of a canon, but the universities are, are, are also very political and very wrong-headed in many ways. You know, that's also a social, a social environment. So like the reality is these are messy um, uh, social judgments, but the collective make-believe is there is a kind of absolute judgment that's somehow made by something, time, right, or I don't know, the gods of art. Um, and I think prizes let us sort of believe that and enjoy it. Uh, so when Gwendolyn Brooks insisted on sharing her prize with Ishmael Reed, I did not know this story. I didn't know that either. Did we know what prize? Uh, was that a singular event? Do, any, do many authors reject prizes? Well, Bob Dylan refused to show up and collect his Nobel, right? That eventually was, that's he a did. He eventually, eventually he did? did. Oh, okay. Yeah. Eventually okay. he did, and then in the last possible moment, he mailed in his tape of his acceptance speech as well, so he collected his million uh, as uh. well. Um, not that he needed a million dollars, but he sold his catalog for 550 million, or is that what it was? Anyway, um, I, did not, I did not know that about, about Gwendolyn Brooks, but the... Um, the refusal of a prize, I think, has become very difficult for, uh, for, for authors. There was a period when it was kind of de rigueur to refuse a prize um, and uh, to, to insist on one's kind of higher purity. But you just don't see that much anymore. And I think because it's seen as a publicity device. It's not really taken seriously. It's like you're spoiled and you're just trying to like have your prize, you know, and, dis and discard it as well, because you're still being named as the greatest. And then you're going, I don't care if you call me the greatest, you know, <laughs> I'm above all that. Uh, so it just doesn't come off anymore. It did for, uh, for a time, there was, a, there was a way to do it. It was always difficult, but that's a very, it's a very challenging symbolic gesture uh, to pull off. Hard to get right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, even, you know, Sartre is, is the one that, is always pointed to as like the great refusenik because he refused his Nobel Prize. But he really, he did not want to ever be offered the Nobel Prize. He wrote to the secretariat um, ahead of time and said, I heard that my name was you know, in the running. Please don't consider me. Please don't give me the prize because I'll have to refuse it because you know me, I've refused all my prize, all prizes offered to me from, from the West you know, and from the Soviet side. I refuse prizes. That's how I maintained my position. So don't do it. I'll have to refuse it. And they didn't get the letter. <laughs> the letter was misplaced. The letter was misplaced. So he gets it, and then he's like, "Oh, I told you guys, I don't want." He did not want to make a big deal of it, but everybody else made a big deal of it. So yeah, I, I think it's very rare. Uh, don't most authors have little regard for critics and awards? Authors will say they have little regard for <laughs> for awards. Um, and there's what, in, in my book, I, I talk about as strategies of condescension, ways that the author, since they can't refuse the prize, probably, they, they can show up and receive the prize, but convey, in certain ways, a bit of distance from the prize, right? I'm not, this isn't something that I, like, am wholeheartedly down with. Um, and it's, it can be, considered kind of an error, a faux pas of the acceptance speech, if you show too much eagerness, if you're too thrilled by the prize, oh my God, I had no idea, you love me so much, you know, you're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to be pretty cool about it. It's like, okay, this is great, thanks so much, but you know, it's the work that matters most. And, um, so that, that, keeping that distance, something of a condescension that is a sort of looking down on the award is proper for the, the, the great author. It's proper for the winner of a prize. Winner of the prize should be a little better than the prize. I think it's the way, the way it works. Uh, is there a potential economic curse for winners to following up with future work and success? An economic curse or, or an artistic curse? Well, I mean, I think it could be. I, the, the question is economic, but I think it could. I mean, if you, uh, 
don't have a great success with a book and there's been an investment or, you know, I could imagine yeah. some sort of economic blowback, yeah? Yeah, I mean, we hear that from, from authors that uh, didn't Bellow call the Nobel the kiss of death or something like that. It's like, you know, especially Lifetime Achievement Awards. You win a Lifetime Achievement Award. It's like, thanks for your lifetime, it was great. See ya, you know, <laughs> so what are you supposed to do then? Um, uh, so Lifetime Achievement Award is a mixed, is a mixed blessing for, for an artist. Um, and the Nobel, of course, is a Lifetime Achievement Award. So if you're really young, you know, you probably don't, don't want it. Um, but I don't think, I think in general, like these Novel of the Year awards, certainly economically they're good for a writer. Um, it means, if nothing else, it means that your next handful of novels are all going to get published. That's not a problem. And that's a problem for a lot of novelists. You can write you know, a novel that does pretty well, and then write another one that doesn't do well, and then you write a third one, and the publishers don't want it. And your agent says, you know what? I can't sell, I, I can't sell this. You know, it's like you're, and now you're, you're, you're of a certain age. You're not hot anymore. No one's interested. This is a very familiar story, right, for novelists. Um, so, but if they win a significant prize, with that first novel, you know, a debut prize, like, you know, the uh, Penn Faulkner or something, um, then their novels are gonna get published because they could put that winner of the Penn Faulkner Prize, best first novelist, you know, prize winning author, all that on the novel, and that will guarantee a certain level of sales. Yeah, so, so no economic, I don't see any economic downside for an author. Psychologically, it might freak them out in some way, it might make it harder to write another novel. Depends. Yeah. Uh, so how were you chosen to be a judge on the National Book Award Committee? Because they read your book and they thought, we're going to mess with his head. I think they thought it was sort of a funny joke. Because <laughs> I'd written this book about prizes, so they said. No, they, I mean, um, it, it was a, a guy named Harold Agenbrom, who was then the foundation head. And I, I had done a panel or two with him talking about prizes. And uh, he'd read the book and was a fan. And so um, he put me on the... Uh, on, on the committee, and I, I said, um, I told him that I would do it, because it's really a ton of work, and I've got a day job, right? You know, I've got a job, um, 400 novels. So I said I would do it if afterwards uh, the judges could sit down with him and talk to the foundation about this terrible problem they have of their dependency on the entrance fees which is why they give 400 books in each of their four categories to the judges and say, deal with it. You know, it's really unfair and wrong-headed. You obviously can't do a serious job of judging 400 novels. So, but they, um, need, they need the money from that many submissions to run the prize. It's like, I don't know, $250 a book, you know, for the editor, the, the publishers pay the, the fee. So, I mean, you do, you do the math, but it's hundreds of thousands of dollars that they get from the fees from the publishers, and that pays the salaries, basically. So, um, so I said, we gotta talk about this, because this is an irresponsible way to do. Uh, but then, after I'd done it, and after the other judges had done it, we were all exhausted, and Harold had, had finished his term, and Lisa Lucas had come in, and she wasn't that interested, so we never had that conversation. And they still, they're still giving 400 books to everybody. Um, well, yeah, yeah, I know my colleague, Chikosi Obioma, uh, he got a course release for being a Booker Prize but a Booker Prize judge, yeah. but that's much lesser task. I would be a Booker Prize judge in a minute. I think he had like a hundred. Like, they do like 80 or 90. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That's different. Uh, so uh, a bit off topic, but this is a ranking question, I think, so you may. Uh, but I think the, this is the person who asked this, the same phenomenon of self-referential assessment and perpetuating the power of prestige can apply to university rankings. Yeah. Uh, so do you have any comments on that? on the economy of university prestige. Uh, yes, don't get me started. <laughs> what to say? I mean, those university rankings are a good example of how when you introduce a ranking system, then you change the behavior of the, um, the, the, the people or institutions being ranked. Um, and they start um, acting toward the ranking systems in order to, to, to move up on the ranking. So, this is a, an ongoing problem, you know, with the U.S. news rankings and all the rankings. They know what's in the, uh, the algorithm, right? So if it's like um, the ratio of applicants to acceptances, 
is important in that ranking, then what do you want to do? Go out and just drum up huge numbers of applications from people who don't have a chance in hell of getting in. Just drive the numbers up. And that's what they've all done. You know, that's what they've done. So, um, and a million other things like that can be, can be tweaked. There's now, at some of the universities, is one of the, um, I want to say UC Irvine, but I shouldn't, because I'm not positive about that. Um, advertised a position a couple of years ago for someone that's a full-time job, administrative job, to um, manage the metrics for the ranking system, right? So this would be like one person in charge of that, of figuring out how they are, um, how they look on the metrics, and you know, making them making them better. There's a lot of data gathering and um, and and kind of data massaging that goes on at universities. The purpose of these rankings. So these rankings are very bad in general. So, uh, no, so, uh, Jack Lynch, one of my cohort at Penn, public, he put something on social media. It was Forbes, and it wasn't this multi-metric thing. But like the best colleges are the ones with the highest giving per alum, and it was all elite private colleges. Yeah. And I was like, well, we could have a different metric, which would be state support of higher state education, of higher education yeah. per student or something. But no, so it was like the best schools are the ones that have the wealthiest alums who give the most money. That's so, right. I yeah. mean, they, they, they'll put the, the, the size of the endowment, you know, rank the universities by size of endowment or size of endowment per student, which is a better measure. And then you put the rankings next to that. And it's, it's scary how far you could go down the list. And they're basically the same lists. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, when Wharton won the Pulitzer Prize for the Age of Innocence, she was distressed to find out that the original selection was Main Street, but it had been seen as too negative. So she reached out to Lewis and they became friends. Have any other winners been somewhat distressed by their awards? Other than, well, we had... Uh, I don't yeah. know, I mean, I don't know that Wharton was distressed by the award, right? But she did, she didn't like that language of wholesomeness and manhood. And all that, and uh, um, but I don't know. I, I'm not a I'm not a scholar of, of, e, of Edith Wharton, but I would take all that with a grain of salt. I think she was probably pretty pleased to have won the award, and I I don't know that she thought that Main Street was a better novel than Age of Innocence. It's not. You know, <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> sorry, but it's not. Uh, and it doesn't. Edith Wharton's a pretty darn good novelist, guys. And it does. He doesn't have cultural it. capital. I mean, yeah. he's rarely taught in That's that right. sense. Yeah. 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 He's faded despite the Nobel Prize, and she hasn't. You know. So I and I think she had a pretty big ego. So I don't know. People talk about prizes differently than how they really feel about them, and differently than how they act in and around them. How they perform them. How they perform them, very good, yeah. yeah. Yeah, Okay, just for fun, what is the most scandalous or questionable story, I think scandalous is better, but uh, related to literary prizes that you've come across in your research? The most scandalous? Geez, you know, I should have like a ready anecdote for that, but I... But I, I, I don't, don't, I think the betting thing with the, the leaked information for the Nobel was pretty good. I mean, good. That's, a, that's a pretty good one, you know, the... Um, the betting on, on the prizes uh, is always like kind of weird how with the Nobel Prize, it doesn't happen every year, but it happened I think about four or five times over the last decade and a half, where you'd have this like real outsider, like Leclasio or someone, you know, who's like 80 to one. If you put a, a bet on her, 100 to one. And then 24 hours before, it happened to trans trauma as well. Like 24 hours before the announcement, suddenly the odds are like six to one. And you go, what? And so people would see that and they go, well, that's obviously the winner because we've seen this happen before. And, they, and so Ladbrokes and the other you know, betting parlors, um, the odds makers, they sh they'll shut the window you know, when, that, when that happens. They say no more bets, like we're not taking any more bets um, because they know that the leak has happened. But, um, but who's leaking, right? Who's going to actually do this? Well, it turned out it was this guy Arnaud, who's a sexual predator, right? And was using his convicted rapist now. Um, this is the Me Too moment in Stockholm. Uh, and he, um, he was using his, his, his proximity um, as this sort of like, what they call him, like the 19th member or whatever of the academy because he was so close to all these guys. And, uh, and using that 
um, to gain power over women, over uh, literary people, especially young literary people, you know, in Europe, in Paris, in Stockholm, um, and also was doing this, this dirty deal with his gambling buddies, and he was getting kickbacks. I don't think they proved, they proved that, but they did forensic analysis of all this, and they came up with, you know, the communications and the bets and so on and so on. So yeah, that's pretty bad. That's pretty scandalous, but prizes are rife with, with scandal. And the way I think about scandal is a little different. It's not so much like, this is really scandalous. It's critics, journalists, and a kind of wider media public, like performing outrage, like, oh, we're so scandalized, we're so shocked, you know, by, uh, by this, like by the bad behavior of an author, you know, at an, in an acceptance speech or something like that, where the scandal is a bit, I think, kind of trumped up. And it's because the scandal is, um, staging of the scandal is kind of a way to stage our whole relationship to prizes, yeah. So I think that was all of our questions. Thank so, you so much for this you. great question. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, mm.